cryptid encounters seem to be some of the most common stories sent into the swamp. And I'm not complaining, I absolutely love reading all the strange and wild allegedly true encounters you guys send in. Today will be no different. We have stories of wendigos, skimwalkers, and everything in between. As always, if you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit yours at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I would love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp, and stories like yours will help keep this show going on a daily basis. Now, without further ado, let us jump right into these creepy and allegedly true cryptid encounter horror stories that'll freak you out tonight. A Possible Wendigo Encounter by Connor P. I was writing the ski lift with a U.S. Army veteran last week. We got to talking and he mentioned that he had spent the previous couple of years living in the South Dakota Badlands. Based on my friend's South Dakota Sasquatch encounter, I asked if he had seen any Sasquatch in the area. He said he had not, though... He was tracking bison and coyote through the region to understand their hunting patterns better. He did, however, relay a story in which he truly felt he had a close call with something called a wendigo in Kansas of all places. There's an old Indian slash Union Army trail that goes through Kansas and my new friend and a buddy of his were hiking along the trail enjoying their annual bird migration. When, all of a sudden, Everything went deathly quiet. That's when he started hearing the sound of a woman screaming bloody murder. And although his companion somehow couldn't listen, the sound seemed to reverberate through the hills. I think my buddy thought I was losing it, he said. But we both heard it go super quiet, which was odd already, as we were smack dab in the middle of a massive bird migratory route. The Kickapoo live in the area presently as a reservation was granted to the tribe back in 1832. And though it was progressively reduced over the years, part of the tribe has continued to live there down to the present time. He said he had never been more confident that someone or something was trying to lure him out into the dense brush to kill him. What was odd though, was that his friend couldn't hear the screaming. But even though it was crystal clear to his ears, and he was standing right next to him, I asked him if he had happened to see the creature or pinpoint the location of the screaming. Not exactly, he said. Though I continued hearing weird sounds and noises, and when we camped out that night things got more bizarre. We hadn't seen a soul for at least two days, and that night I was on high alert, so I had a tough time falling asleep. Every little sound had me poking out of my bivy sack with my 1911 style 45 pistol, scanning the area for any signs of movement. What was creepy at one point, he said that he thought he saw a tall, dark shadow move from behind a tree to another one, and possibly what might have been a hand reaching out around the tree before slowly retreating into the stillness of the night. When he finally did fall asleep, his dreams were plagued by nightmares of him trying to escape some unseen assailant while running wildly through the brush, cutting his face and arms against the brambles. He'd finally return to the safety in his dream, at which point would only start over again as if on repeat over and over again. This happened for what felt like ages until he had finally woken up in a cold sweat and gone back to scanning the perimeter. At long last, dawn broke and the sun gradually rose. They packed up their little camp and had no more run-ins with the entity, though the experience had left him shook, as he had said. In her books, American Monsters, Linda Godfrey states that the Chippewa, Ottawa, and Potawatomi tribes in Kansas believe that there is an evil, man-eating giant human who was turned into this terrifying beast due to some slight to another or through a variety of sins. The Chippewa believed that selfishness, gluttony, or cannibalism would turn a tribe member into a wendigo for punishment. Descriptions vary from tribe to tribe, but most describe a large, elk-like predator that preys on people who wander too far into its domain. Many report hearing sounds such as a baby crying, a woman screaming, or a voice playing on a static loop of sorts. 
perhaps a phrase the beast somehow recorded from previous victims, typically something along the lines of a cry for help or who's there or help I'm lost or something along those lines. The idea is that the basic human instinct that leads people into the wilderness to help whomever is in need will lure them into their demise. Another common theme is hearing the voice of a loved one, maybe your mother luring you out into the woods or even a familiar form appearing in the mist, followed by the gradual realization that the voice is off or that it's not quite right. Often, these things are much too tall, too slender, and their arms are much too long to be a human, but it's far too late by the time you realize it. All of these possibilities we discussed while also discussing other native folklore such as deer woman and shape-shifting witches, all of which are relatively common motifs in mythology of the region. It was an interesting conversation by far, and one of the creepiest stories I think I've ever heard. And anyways, I just wanted to say thank you Swamp Dweller for sharing the story. Deadwood is a Strange Town by Samantha I go mushroom picking every year. I live in the Pacific Northwest, specifically Oregon. This happened just outside of Eugene, just on the edge of a small town called Deadwood. My boyfriend and I have this hidden little spot on BLM property every year for Chantrell slash King Bolsters hunting. Because it's on BLM property, we don't have to deal with hunters. Unfortunately, mushroom hunters and deer hunting season do coincide. Because it is the Bureau of Land Management property, no hunting is permitted, and we've been out there Chantrell hunting for many, many years together. And we know the area well. We always know to never split up, and we've never seen anything bad here. You know, there are creatures in the woods, of course. It's Oregon. The trees are thick. We got mad at each other one day for whatever reason. Probably something stupid. It was muddy, and we went mushroom hunting up and down steep slopes. My boots were filling with rain and mud. He was mad and dumb enough to walk ahead of me and put too much distance between us. This is when I started yelling and getting no response. All of the sudden, everything went dead freaking silent. I've never heard this much silence, not even the sound of rain. It was deafening like a loud ringing in my ears. I became aware of everything. I knew I was being watched. I quickly dug a hole and sat down. That's how my, my body reacted. I was so scared. I looked into the trees and there was this like invisible human thing. It's hard to explain. It was above us into the trees and it was looking straight at me. I stood still as a statue, trying not to make eye contact and waiting for this thing to go away, whatever it was. It didn't seem to be going away though. It was just sitting there, staring at me intently. After just a few minutes, but was probably no more than just a minute, my boyfriend came back, tapped me on the shoulder and asked what I was doing and what I was shaking in the mud. I looked up at the tree and this thing was gone. I don't know what I saw, I don't know why it felt like it was warping me into my own little bubble, but I was absolutely shook into the core. I told him, I, I don't know what I told him, honestly, I just told him I, fr I had a panic attack from the, from the argument, and we just tried to walk down the hill calmly, but I've never been able to explain what that was. It almost looked human, but it was like invisible, but not quite invisible, if you get what I mean. I could see almost through it, but I could see like the outline of its body, its eyes though. They were so demonic. I think it was a skimwalker by Kayla R. Okay, I don't know whether or not it was a skimwalker, a wendigo, or something else, but what I encountered, it was something absolutely nightmarish. This happened shortly after my mom passed away on March 22nd of 2021. A week or so after her passing, I was outside at night, walking the length of the driveway for some exercise, when I heard what sounded like my mom's voice coming from the very tall grass. I knew it couldn't be my mom, clearly, so I shakily walked back to the house, entered, and locked the door. 
Roughly about a month later, I was sitting in the lawn chair outside at night to relax. I remember I was pretty close to falling asleep when a shadow covered me. I opened my eyes to see what looked like a deer standing just behind my lawn chair looking down at me. I remember seeing its eyes. They were wrong though, like they were almost glowing white and there was this overwhelming smell of rotten flesh. Like when you come across a fresh carcass that's been sitting in the sun for a day or two. It was absolutely putrid and made me want to retch instantly. I remember slowly standing, turning to face the thing, and slowly backing away from it as it stared down at me with this death glare, like it hated me. Finally, when I was just a foot from the front steps, the thing turned and began to walk away back towards the tree line. I turned and ran to the stairs only to hear an ear-piercing scream seconds after. I looked back and this thing ran at me on its hind legs. I got the door open, got inside, and locked it immediately. I heard another scream and listened to my mom's voice begging to be let in, but I have a dog, and he went nuts trying to attack the door. Since then, I only go outside when it's daytime and to let my dog use the bathroom. I haven't seen that thing since. I carry a 7-inch blade dagger with me every time I go outside at night now. I know it might not be much, but it makes me feel a little bit more secure. Possible Encounter with Something Unearthly by Schnizzle I was tree planting near Smithers, British Columbia, about an hour and a half into the mountains on dirt roads. I tried my best just to forget this incident ever occurred, but I could not find any way to rationalize what happened. I don't really care who believes me, but this happened and I will stick to my guns on that. It was almost midnight and I was trying to sleep in my tent. My tent was near many dead trees that would creak when the wind picked up, loud and distinct sounds. Now on this particular night, it was dead silent and still. I started to hear sticks cracking and slow footsteps starting to get closer over about a 15 minute span. Finally, it was loud enough that I was sure a bear was approaching my tent. It got so close that it had to be no further than 15 feet from me. It was cracking sticks and padding around the forest floor. I decided to yell out very loudly. I was answered with nothing but absolute deafening silence which was creepier than hearing anything back at all. There was no sound of the creature fleeing or doing anything. I sat in silence too scared to move, trying to rationalize to no conclusion. Then about 20 minutes of dead silence later I heard the eeriest, unnatural and most unexplainable noise. It was the same timber and volume and basically the same as the trees outside cracking, but instead of being a regular creak it would start and then hold that same note and grind to a stop. It was the most unnatural droning that I've ever heard and definitely not a tree creaking. There was no hint of wind or any other trees creaking as usual. I barely slept a wink that night and the next day was tough. I just had to forget about it. I didn't even make the connection that skimwalkers are known to imitate sounds like that until a few weeks ago. This happened in July of 2022. I would love to know if anybody in the swamp has had any similar experiences. Good evening, Swamp Dweller. I am an Inuk man from Northern Canada and I wanted to tell you about the time in my younger days when I believe our hunting party faced off with an Ezerak, an evil being that takes the shape of a caribou. I am an old man now, and this story takes place many years ago in what is now the territory of Nunavut, Canada. In those days, many of us Inuit still lived in the traditional ways of hunting, fishing, and living from what the land gave us before we were forced into communities by the Canadian government and RCMP. In winter, we travel far from our homes to hunt the seals and great caribou herds from which we took our meat and furs. This story takes place during one of these trips that are now long gone. Myself, my brother, an elder, and another man set out from our houses to track the caribou herds. Snowmobiles were only new back then, and only one man had one. The rest of us traveled by dog sled. We had enough supplies for two weeks loaded on our sleds as well as several hunting spears and three World War II era rifles. This was in the late 1960s, so they were plentiful in those times. After a three day long trip, 
we managed to track the herd and made our snow houses for the night. As the sun came up the next morning, we set up our rifles on a ridge overlooking the herd, and not long after my brother spied a beautiful fat male among the others. We quickly drew a bead on several other caribou and opened fired. Within a few minutes there were seven dead animals waiting for us on the snow. We made quick work skinning and gutting the first six, but immediately upon looking at the seventh we knew something was not quite right. Its fur was ragged. Its eyes were not normal. They looked like that of a man, not a caribou. As my brother stuck his knife into the animal, its eyes jerked to the side and stared directly at him. We jumped back but quickly passed it off as a death reflex. But when the animal was opened, we were met with horror. Its meat was black and festering. The smell was so bad we were nearly made sick. The elder knew immediately that something was terribly wrong, and the decision was made to douse the carcass in gas and burn it. As we rode away with our kills, we began to get a very uneasy feeling, so we stopped for a minute and let the dogs rest. As we looked back, we noticed something moving on the far hill, and we were shocked when we looked back at it with binoculars. The caribou we thought was burned was slowly trotting behind us. The bullet wound was now a dark brown stain, and those human-like eyes were staring right through the glass at us. We immediately hitched the dogs and rode as fast as we could. We traveled several miles the opposite direction over the sea ice to hide our trail and keep it from finding our camp. As darkness came, we finally lost the creature in the snow. All that night, two of us stayed awake with guns at the ready. We cut our trip short and fled back to town at first light. The elders blessed us and our meat to ward off any bad magic the Ejirak may have brought on us. This spirit takes on the shape of a caribou and is said to kill hunters and kidnap children. There have been many, many other memorable hunting trips in my long life but this one stands out to me the clearest. This was a few years ago, and I have not done much of any research on it until very, very recently. My family and I had gone up to my grandparents' house. They have about 10 acres of land and only used about one to one and a half acres for the house and yard. They had a large, dense pine forest all around the area of their house, except for the road that led into their house. They had cut down some trees to make four-wheeler paths that we could ride on when we went up there. One day, my sister and I were riding out on the paths on some of my grandparents' four-wheelers. For whatever reason, it slips my mind, but I think it was to get a drink, but I do not entirely remember, my sister went inside. I thought nothing of it and kept riding the four-wheeler I was on. Well, probably about three minutes or so later, I was driving past a dense patch of the forest. Over the four-wheeler engine, I heard a loud growl. I heard it clearly to my left in the patch of forest. Thinking it was just a coyote, I looked over towards where the growl had come from. I didn't see any coyote. You know that feeling you get when you investigate a forest at night and you get scared something will stare back at you? Well, this happened to me in the middle of the day. What I was looking at still haunts me to this day. I was staring into two large, yellow eyes. It appeared that they were sunken into the creature's face. The eyes were probably about two times the size of a normal human eye, and they were watching me intently. I could see by looking at the thing's eyes alone that this was not any normal creature, and it was smart. I did not get to see what it was entirely because it was standing in a bush. The bush was exceptionally large, like probably 10 feet tall or so. About eight feet up in this bush, is where I saw these eyes poking out, staring at me. I could not see any other part of this creature, but I did not stick around to find out what it was. I put the four-wheeler into drive and sped up to about 55 or 60 miles per hour. I ran inside and did not go back out on the pass for the rest of the trip. No one else in my family saw anything, but I was terrified of whatever it was. Fast forward six years, I was talking with my friend about spooky things we had seen. I told him about this story, and began to wonder what I could possibly have seen. I did a lot of research on what large predatory animals live up there. It is northern Idaho if you do not believe me and want to go check. After a little bit of digging, I found that no animals were about eight feet tall. I did not believe it because I was skeptical of anything that was paranormal. I checked again and again, and because I could not find anything, and I did not want to believe that it was something that had never been captured before or proven to exist, I just tried to push it out of my mind. The largest wolf ever found has only been about six feet tall when standing on its hind legs. The largest bear might have been large enough, but it could not fit in that bush. So I began to research any possible creature that it could have been. Eventually, I found one, a wendigo. It was the only possible creature I could have seen. I do not know why it did not attack me or why it let me get away. 
Based off the features I saw, the large yellow sunken eyes, it could have only been a Wendigo. What scared me even more is that a couple of years later my grandparents moved out of that house for an unknown reason. They say it was to get closer to the family, but the family was actually excited about making that long drive and coming up very often. They moved a little bit closer. It's still a long drive, but I haven't seen that monster ever since. This incident was the most terrifying experience of my life. This happened in the fall of 1982 in Baxter State Park, Maine. I live in Manchester, New Hampshire at the time and desperately wanted to get one last camping trip in before the weather changed. The region would become buried in snow and tourists from out of state for the skiing season would come in. It was early November and it was still warm during the day and nice and chilly at night, perfect for sitting around the fire and relaxing. I loved the outdoors, I still do, but the events of that night in Maine would leave a mark on me for the rest of my life. My wife worked all weekend at the hospital downtown, and both the kids are at grandma and grandpa's for the weekend. I called in sick for work, loaded up my Bronco, strapped the canoe on the roof, and hit the interstate. I was on the water late in the afternoon. I loved the area because of how remote it was. I was just a few miles from my launch site, where the truck was parked, when I spotted a perfect place to camp. I paddled toward the shore. This is a great spot, I thought to myself. I set up my little tent, built a fire, and unfolded my pack chair to relax. The day turned into night, and I crashed out in the tent. The following day, I awoke to the sounds of birds chirping. It was a little cooler, but still great weather. I took my camera out, and I went into the forest to take some photos. I did some fishing and just enjoyed the peaceful stillness of this remote wilderness. The day was uneventful, and soon after dinner, I lay in my tent with my flashlight reading. I must have dozed off because I awoke startled by something moving outside of my tent. I lay still, but my instinct told me that there was something outside. I could hear the carefully placed steps of something. There are moose and black bear up here. Moose can be extremely dangerous if you walk upon them by surprise. The bears generally smell you before you see them and keep away. I lay still and listened. Whatever it was had stopped at the entrance flap of the tent. As my eyes adjusted to the darkness, I could make out a faint, shadowy shape. I was wide awake now and on full alert. Whatever it was, I could hear it sniffling around and panting out of breath. I slowly began to unzip the tent when it ran off. I unzipped the flap of my tent and looked out just in time to see the branches swaying and hear something heavy moving through the brush and into the deep woods. The sound of its footfalls told me one important thing. It was on two legs. That could not be right. I had not seen any other people since entering the park and leaving my truck at the trailhead. The tourist season for leaf peepers had passed, and even so, someone could only reach this location by the waterway. I suppose someone could be out here, someone I had not seen or heard until they came sniffing and snorting around my campsite in the middle of the night. I guess it was possible. As the sun rose, I ate my breakfast but remained on guard. I could not shake the feeling of being watched. I felt a presence in the forest, someone or something just out of sight. I kept a 45 revolver on me when I camped out here in the North Woods. Was not so much concerned about the wildlife, so much as the weirdos you might run across, the meth heads, the backcountry types. In my experience, the scariest thing you can come across when you are alone in the deep woods is another human being. I could not be sure if someone were out there, but the paranoia began to take hold. It was dark now, and I was inside my tent. I kept the revolver close and my boots on. I was done playing games. I sure did not plan on shooting anyone, but I was sure to show them I was not an easy target. I sat up quickly. I must have fallen asleep because I was startled awake by movement all around the tent. The shadows everywhere, on all sides and all directions. I could hear sniffing and snorting, low grunting and raspy breathing. What the hell is happening? I thought in a panic. It did not sound like people, but the height of the shadows cast against the flaps of the tent in the moonlight revealed prominent, upright figures. There must have been five or maybe even six on all sides. Fear gripped me as the realization came over me. I was surrounded. Suddenly, low growling started all around me. It was answered back on the other side, and all around me were low, deliberate growls. Were these coyotes? Were the massive shadows just a light playing tricks on me? The growling increased in pitch and intensified, and I knew an attack was imminent. I pulled my revolver out and fired straight up into the air. The next moments were a complete blur. I charged through the tent with just the clothes on my back and my 45 and the truck keys in my pocket. I bolted straight for the canoe and muscled it into the water. 
I jumped in and began paddling. I never looked back until I got far enough from the shore. I should have never looked back. There they were, standing completely still on the riverbank. Their bodies crouched down, with heads low, eyes reflecting in the moonlight. They looked like giant coyotes or maybe even wolves. Six in total. I was transfixed by what I was seeing. I had never seen a coyote this large, this massive. As I sat in the safety of my little canoe studying these creatures, they did something I'll never forget. They began to stand up on their hind legs. Each one would slowly raise on two legs. I could not believe what I was seeing. They all stood like men. These things, these, these creatures, had almost ambushed me as their prey. I turned and furiously paddled as howling rang out behind me. Never swerve to miss a deer. You could hit something much worse. By Horror Rider 1717. It was one of those days. The fog hovered like a curtain waiting to rise on a show. Being called into work on only three hours of sleep was terrible. Driving through thick fog, I can feel the car holding back, making for an exciting morning. Maybe listening to Metallica's All Nightmare Long at 3 a.m. wasn't the best choice. It started with the floating legs. As I drove, I saw a pair of blue jeans standing alongside of the road. Just the legs, though. It was like someone had stood half a dummy beside the road to freak people out. As I came closer, I could see a black hoodie on top of them in a vaguely human form. The head turned towards me and I could see nothing inside the hoodie. A chill went up my spine as my foot went down on the accelerator. I was so freaked out that I never saw the deer running straight toward me. It wasn't until it was right beside my car that I noticed it. It startled me so badly that I swerved to miss it and ended up on a side of the road that I had never driven on or ever seen before. I had gone far before I calmed down and realized I must have made a wrong turn in my franticness. Finally, I stopped in front of a sign that mesmerized me. It was once a standard road sign that had a deer crossing on it, with the silhouette of a buck leaping in the air. However, this one had been modified by a talented artist. The painted additions made the deer enormous, more significant than a moose. It also had a mouthful of shark-like teeth, a spiked tail, and glowing red eyes. The sight of this fanciful creature should have made me laugh, but after the morning I had already had, it chilled me to the bone. I immediately did a three-point turn and floored it out of there. I maybe made it a hundred yards. My front tire, which wasn't in the most excellent shape, gave in to the stress and had a catastrophic blowout. This plus my speed sent me careening off the road and into a deep ravine. At least, that's where I woke up, in a deep ravine. I willed my blurry eyes to clear and was immediately sorry I had. Every window was shattered, tree limbs shot in this way and that all through the car's interior. It looked like the love child of an Ent and a Buick. My seatbelt held me firm and the deflated airbag lay before me. I leaned forward and was rewarded twice. The first is pain. My chest and arms felt like they were on fire. The second was the realization that I wasn't on the ground. The car creaked and groaned when I moved. I could not see how far it was to the bottom though, because of the same fog that got me into this entire predicament. Okay, this isn't good. I can't even hope for help. No one would ever see me down here. I did some physical assessments to keep me calm, staring at the feet. Toes wiggle, that's good. Right leg bends, left leg. Oh my god. I'm going to call feeling like I've been stabbed by a thousand knives bad. I leaned forward just enough to see my leg. My pants were covered in blood, tried to reach the wound, but stopped when the branch made a cracking sound. Okay, we'll come back to that. Moving on, my lower abdomen seems okay, my ribs feel like they're the main course at a barbecue, and my arms shoot daggers whenever I move them. The most disturbing part is the lack of blood on my shirt. Okay, end assessment. Possible broken leg, ribs, and internal bleeding. Car destroyed, hanging precariously in a tree that could give out and send me falling to my death in any minute. Low possibility of rescue due to the early morning fog and being out of sight of the road. So essentially, I'm dead. The worst part of all of this was alone with my thoughts, knowing that death was on its way and there was nothing I could do about it. All these thoughts disappeared as a slight breeze made the hair on my neck stand on end and I heard a low rumble. I slowly turned my face to see the noise and wondered if I was hallucinating. I saw two substantial red orbs coming steadily toward me out of the fog. As they approached, I could see they were attached to something horrific. The creature stopped right beside my car. 
the artist on the sign, didn't do it justice. My breathing became rapid and shallow as my heart jackhammered in my chest. A warm liquid ran down my leg that had nothing to do with the car injury that I sustained. This thing's glowing red eyes were the size of basketballs. Its teeth looked like they had come straight from a shark. Its claws were as long as hunting knives. I stifled a scream as my injuries were forgotten. The enormous red eyes were so close that I could feel the warmth coming off of them. It stared at me. Don't move. Don't breathe. Don't think. It ripped the door off the car and inhaled as it was sniffing me. It backed out, grabbed the car, and shook it out of the tree until it toppled onto its roof. God damn. The roof collapsed from the weight and missed crushing my head by mere inches. I nearly lost consciousness from the unbearable pain as I hung upside down from my seatbelt strapped across my broken ribs. The car began to move. Meadow protested as it was dragged through the woods. Oh no, it's taking me back to its cave. I tried to reach the seatbelt release, but the pain was too great. I was being dragged helplessly to my death. This ride from hell taught me the meaning of pain for what seemed like an eternity. Every bump and jostle was a new lesson. The metal screeched in protest as the car finally stopped. The creature sniffed me again. Go ahead, eat me, I screamed. I hope I give you indigestion. The red orb stared at me as if sizing me up to see if it would be enough trouble to rip me out of the car. Finally, in desperation, I used the only thing I had available. I reached up painfully and pressed the horn. The creature jumped and screamed a loud cry that defied description. The last thing I remember was it running off into the trees as my mind led me into a blissful unconsciousness. Beep, beep, beep. Alright, I'm up already. I reached for my alarm clock, but it wasn't there. My bedroom wasn't there either. I woke up to incessant beeps pounding my aching head. I looked around the white room at the machines that seemingly were keeping me alive. My eyes settled on the man in uniform standing at the foot of my bed, staring at me. Good morning, he said. Good morning, I rasped back. My name's Sheriff Seacrest. I realize this isn't the best time, but I need to ask you a few questions about your accident. Uh, okay. From the skid marks on the road, I figured you were doing at least 80 when your tire blew. Any reason you were going that fast? Am I under arrest? The sheriff studied me for a second. No, you're not under arrest. I'm trying to figure out what happened. I, I was scared, I said, barely above a whisper. Scared of what? Of whatever was in the fog. So what was in the fog? I lay quiet for a long time. I wrestled with the implications of telling someone else what I saw. I wasn't even sure myself. My imagination. The sheriff seemed a little disappointed. So how did you get your car out of the tree, dragged a hundred yards, and set on the side of a road? Uh, I don't know, sheriff. I wish I had the answers for you, but I blacked out when I landed in the tree and woke up here. And that's all you remember? Yes, sir. Was there any wildlife around? Wh wh what do you mean wildlife? Oh, you know squirrels, foxes, deer, he said, emphasizing the last word. N nothing I, I saw, as I said, I, I blacked out. He closed his notebook. Thank you for your help. I hope you recover soon. I hope so too. The sheriff started toward the door, stopped, turned back, and looked me in the eyes as if he desperately wanted to say something, faltered, and said, You're fortunate to be alive. Thanks for listening to these creepy and allegedly true cryptid encounter horror stories that'll freak you out tonight. If you enjoyed these stories, be sure to elbow that like button in the face as it helps me out a ton. The more likes this episode gets, the more YouTube promotes it to fresh new eyes and that helps the swamp grow its ever-expanding waters. If you're new to the swamp, be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications to never miss a brand new episode as I upload them nearly every single day on all things natural and supernatural. If you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, whether it's an allegedly true encounter with something in the woods, maybe a cryptid encounter, maybe some sort of crazy strange guy tried to steal your cookies while you were camping, I'd love to know. Be sure to send it in at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description. You can also go to reddit slash the dark swamp and you can also submit it there. I'd love to know what story was your favorite tonight. Be sure to comment them down below in the comments so I can pick better stories in the future. 
And if you made it all the way to the end, be sure to comment today's code word, which is Slithering Anaconda. Be sure to comment that down below in a funny manner to confuse anybody. The funniest one will get pinned on the top of the comments. Thank you guys, as always, for supporting the swamp the way you do. I couldn't do this on a daily basis without you guys. Be sure to join me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and all that cool stuff, and I'll see you all soon with another creepy episode.